So I'm going to go get started. It's about two after, and we'll be welcoming more guests as they come in. But uh, I'm Christopher Rufo. I'm the director of the Center on Wealth and Poverty at the Discovery Institute. Uh, over the past two years, my research has focused on the interconnected issues of homelessness, addiction, mental illness, and crime. And I've spent most of this time focused on West Coast cities, from Vancouver, Canada, uh, all the way down to Los Angeles, and looking at these coastal cities where the problem seems to be most concentrated. And um, <clears throat> one of the questions that, uh, that is really unfolding rapidly as we speak, and we're starting to collect more information, starting to understand more of this situation, is that with the COVID-19, with the coronavirus epidemic, um, it's really changing some of the way that governments and policymakers are handling the issues of homelessness, mental illness, and addiction. Um, specifically, West Coast cities are now really grappling with a problem that has been, uh, that has been brewing, that has been growing, that has been increasing now uh, for two decades. And the, the, the virus has really put a lot of these problems that have been slowly growing uh, into sharp relief. So uh, I think in a way the coronavirus has started to reveal some longstanding truths about homelessness, about addiction, and about mental illness that really for the past decade, policymakers have largely avoided these questions or largely been in denial about the true nature of the causes of homelessness. So I'll talk a bit about the narrative, the predominant political narrative that has been happening in West Coast cities over the past decade. Uh, I'll talk a bit about why those narratives uh, aren't helpful, are actually misleading and misinforming the public and prevent us from uh, adopting real policy solutions to these issues. I'll talk then a bit about how the COVID-19 has uh, impacted uh, all of these cities and really revealed some inner truths about the situation, um, both for the positive and for the negative. And then I'll talk about um, how policymakers are responding, both the good and the bad. Uh, and then I'll talk about at the end a bit about uh, what I think some of the lessons we should learn are and what I think um, are the real solutions to these problems. So um, first of all, the narrative that you've heard, and it's been uh, really pounded into the public discourse uh, by political leaders, by academics, by the media, and by advocacy groups, is that homelessness is a housing problem. Uh, you may have seen uh, the, the organizations like the McKinsey study or the Zillow study that have looked for a statistical correlation between rising rents and rising homelessness uh, in cities like Seattle, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Um, and what these narratives downplay and deny and really try to push out of the discourse is they don't acknowledge the role of human problems, predominantly addiction and mental illness. And activists and media organizations have really tried very, uh, very hard to push any discussion of those issues out of the public discourse and really hammer in on housing. And I'll talk a bit about why I think that, uh, why I think they're motivated to do so and also where their arguments uh, break down. So first of all, the kind of homelessness is a housing problem argument, um, even within the context of the studies that are cited most often by Mayor Garcetti, by Mayor Durkin, uh, by Mayor London Breed in San Francisco. Uh, one of their favorites is a McKinsey study that showed a rise in homelessness and a rise in rents uh, in Seattle over the course of about five years. Um, but if you look at the data in many other cities, you'll find that that's actually not correlated. Obviously, to a certain extent, as, as rents get more expensive, it puts uh, a tremendous pressure on low-income people. It puts uh, a, a pressure on people who may have been struggling to get by uh, before the rent increases. But what we've seen in the data is that um, housing in itself is not a huge contributor to homelessness. And let me explain why, and I'll use some data. Um, you know, first of all, on the Zillow study that is, that is really cited uh, over and over, if you read above the, the top line of the study that says homelessness and rising rents are, are correlated in these four markets, uh, what most people ignore is if you go into the body of the study, you'll see that in 21 of the top 25 major American cities, homelessness is actually not correlated with rent increases. In these 21 cities, rents have gone up, but homelessness has either remained stable or decreased. 
Um, and in a city like Houston, for example, where rents have increased uh, on par with some of the major uh, coastal cities, um, they've actually been able to reduce their uh, homelessness problem by more than 50% over the past eight years, despite increases in rent. So if you take a broader view, you'll actually find they're not correlated. I've also worked with the data scientists at Microsoft on some new studies that, that really look at um, how much does rent increases contribute to uh, kind of varieties and, and, and uh, the variations in homelessness across states. And what we've found is that uh, the increase in rent does account for some of the increase in homelessness by state, but what actually accounts for a much greater percentage of that, uh, again, this change over time, is permissive public policies as measured by prevailing political attitudes. And I think that this is really where the crux of the issue happens. There are, I think, three things that are predominant in why you see a huge disparity uh, in homelessness across different cities. Um, you know, first of all, you have uh, addiction and drug policy. Uh, what we've seen, uh, the California Policy Lab at UCLA has released a study, an analysis of all the federal homelessness data that shows that more than three quarters of the unsheltered homeless, that's people you see on the streets, people you see in cars and tents on the side of the road, uh, more than three quarters have uh, a substance abuse disorder. And it varies by city. Um, it seems that the further north you get, like Seattle, it's predominantly heroin and fentanyl and other opioids. And as you get further south, it actually becomes predominantly uh, methamphetamine. So in, in Los Angeles, for example, it's about 70% of the, of the drug abuse among the homeless population, we estimate it's about uh, is, is methamphetamine use. So, so drug addiction is a huge driver. And you can understand this causally uh, just by understanding that if you have a serious drug addiction, you have maybe one or $2,000 a month habit. Um, you know, most of the population, uh, more than 95% of the unsheltered have no source of income, no source of employment. Um, you can understand very quickly how you would end up on the streets. And, but on top of that, what we've seen is it's not just drug addiction. There's drug addiction in every city around the country, but you have permissive policies that enable drug addiction, that reduce penalties for uh, crimes of public disorder, open drug dealing, and what you're seeing right now in the COVID-19 crisis, you're seeing this really is shined a light on this problem. In San Francisco, for example, I wrote a piece for City Journal that's examining what's happening in the wake of coronavirus. And what you're seeing is that policymakers have essentially supercharged decriminalization. Right now in the Tenderloin, you have uh, hundreds of tents lining the streets. You have actually a, a circle of tents around San Francisco City Hall. And San Francisco political leaders and law enforcement leaders have basically adopted a free-for-all policy. So you have uh, people who are essentially allowed and permitted to operate open-air drug markets uh, in the Soma and Tenderloin neighborhoods. And what do you get when you allow people to uh, really operate uh, open-air drug markets, open-air drug abuse with impunity? You get a high concentration of those, uh, of those things. And we see from the data in San Francisco that uh, at least 50% of people who are homeless and on the streets of San Francisco migrated to San Francisco uh, after becoming homeless somewhere else. Um, and I think from the field work that I've done, it's very clear that they're coming there for those permissive policies uh, regarding drug abuse and property crime. So that's one. Uh, the second one is mental illness. And as I mentioned at the beginning, and for those of you who are trickling in, um, I've spent actually the past week continuing to do some field work. Uh, I just spent uh, a Monday on a tour of Thurston County, Washington. Uh, I went to their homeless encampments. Uh, I talked to caseworkers. I tagged along with police officers that are dealing with the uh, homeless population on the streets in Olympia, Washington. Um, and I also went into their jail system and interviewed prison guards and interviewed inmates that are sp struggling specifically with mental illness. And the numbers that I've found, I think, would shock you. So, for example, when I went to the uh, Olympia, city of Olympia's mitigation site, it's really a sanctioned open-air homeless encampment. Um, I asked caseworkers, what do you estimate to be the prevalence of mental illness among the street population in Olympia? And the caseworker manager who was there said, it's almost 100%. Almost everyone here 
um, ha is presenting symptoms of mental illness, has been treated for mental illness, or is taking psychiatric medication for mental illness. So very high rates of prevalence. Um, this is more than the academic data and survey data suggests, um, but I think that it's a, a real accurate um, reflection of what happens. And you know, you see people screaming in the streets, threatening. Um, I talked to one gentleman who was convinced that there were monsters coming out of the ground trying to control him and hurt him. And because of our policies regarding mental illness, we've decided as a society that that's okay. And instead of having people uh, in uh, involuntary treatment for severe schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, we've really released all of these people to the streets. And what happens is that if you are a schizophrenic, if you have a co-occurring substance abuse disorder, um, the next place you're gonna get, end up is first the streets and then the jail. Uh, when I was in the Olympia City Jail, I talked to prison, uh, the jail guards and they said they do an intake interview for everyone that comes in the door. And they estimate that between 90 and 95% of the people who are uh, incarcerated at the Olympia City Jail, according to their interviews, have uh, a, a, a mental health disorder. Um, so, this is really an astronomical number. It surprised me. It was higher than the, uh, the studies that I have read, but talking to them and then talking to some of the mentally ill resident or inmates in the jail, it became very apparent that mental illness is in fact a huge driver. Um, and the, the studies again from UCLA that I cited about drug abuse, they also suggest that about three quarters of the unsheltered homeless suffer from a mental illness. And and you know you can see that in the abstract and i know many of you who are on this uh, webinar have probably read the studies have probably maybe even read some of my articles and you you understand these issues in the abstract but when you're face to face with it it's 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 astonishing it's heartbreaking um, i talked to a lot of people who were really struggling this week and as the streets have been emptied out of all regular daily life of all regular businesses Downtown Seattle, downtown Olympia, in many cases, business owners, restaurant owners, bar owners are actually just boarding up their shops, waiting for life to return to normal. You see even more clearly without the kind of, uh, kind of hustle of the city, you see the role of mental illness. You see people wandering in the streets. I met people who were uh, in this week who were literally sleeping in the streets, screaming and kicking and unfortunately tagging along with their crisis response unit because of how our system is designed on mental illness, there's nothing that police officers, there's nothing that psychiatrists, there's nothing that mental health outreach workers can do. Um, unfortunately, because of the policy regime federally and at the state level, we've basically condemned an entire class of people who are mentally ill to the streets, to the jails, and to the emergency room. Um, so, that's the second driver of homelessness. Again, first, substance abuse, second, mental illness, and third, something I've touched on, but is really critical that shows the variation. Because again, substance abuse and mental illness happen everywhere. But the question is, what, what be, why do cities like Seattle, San Francisco, and Los Angeles become the focal point for street homelessness? Um, and that we've seen an even clearer relief during COVID-19. The answer is permissive policies. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm working with a data scientist at Microsoft, and we're looking at the, the data and the, the, the variations and the spread and the distribution of concentrations of homelessness. We found it to be highly correlated, um, not with rents, but with prevailing political attitudes. And just this week, I think it's actually astonishing. And I, I, I think that it signals some hope for the future. Um, as I mentioned, the kind of dominant progressive narrative has always been, this is a housing problem, this is not a substance abuse or mental illness problem, uh, and even denying that people uh, from outside of these major metros uh, move to them to live on the streets, to live uh, in open air encampments, uh, to seek services. That's been really a taboo for many years, and I've raised it over the years, and and, uh, and, and some folks get, uh, have been getting upset about it, but I've stuck to my guns. And what we're finding out um, just this week is that the, the coronavirus crisis has forced political leaders to actually finally accept that addiction, uh, mental illness, and permissive policies are creating a big part of this problem. Uh, just yesterday, the mayor of San Francisco, London Breed, 
held a press conference to say that their plan to provide hotel rooms for the homeless um, is encountering all sorts of problems and that the city is not equipped to deal, even though they've rented at least 8,000 hotel rooms for their homeless population. Uh, the mayor of San Francisco said, we're not ready to move people off the streets into these hotel rooms because of the chronic, debilitating, and frankly dangerous nature of substance abuse and mental illness among this population. Uh, the mayor said that they're simply not equipped to deal with those problems, and they're finding that in the vast majority of cases of the unsheltered, those are the actual problems. Um, that's been trickling out over the past week. And then just yesterday, the mayor of San Francisco, London Breed, um, announced very plainly in a press conference, something that we at Discover Institute have been uh, arguing for years. She said, because we're renting hotel rooms and providing them for the homeless, it's actually attracted people from outside the city of San Francisco, outside the county, and even outside the state. They're now flocking to San Francisco to try to access uh, those free services, those uh, free hotel rooms. And then the general permissive attitude where you can uh, have a hotel room, you can go down the street to the Tenderloin or the Soma, uh, you can buy, sell, and use drugs. Um, you don't have to maintain any of the social distancing. And what we're seeing is, I think, a, a reckoning of progressive policies, um, especially in cities like San Francisco, that for whatever reason seem to actually be a bit more ahead of the curve than other cities. I think maybe because their problem is so much worse uh, than somewhere like Seattle or large, large portions of Los Angeles. Um, so I think that's really the city to watch. And um, I can send everyone a link to a piece that I wrote, but what we're seeing specifically with the coronavirus, we're seeing um, all of those latent themes, all of those latent problems really kind of punching policymakers in the face. Um, they can no longer deny that mental illness, that addiction, that permissive policies play a role in the crisis. They're starting to actually break down um, activists, social service providers, um, you know, political progressives, socialist movements. You can see them right now in the media really kind of hysterically trying to maintain those old fictions, maintain this old narrative about housing. But even progressive political leaders like London Breed, even some county council members or you know, board of supervisors members in San Francisco are starting to finally say, it's not just about housing. There's all these other human problems that we have to deal with. And residents are getting so upset with their neighborhoods turning into tent cities that they're starting to feel the heat, they're starting to feel the political pressure, and they're starting to finally do something about it. Um, and I, I think another interesting angle, um, and many of you are probably curious, and uh, I hope that some of you can submit questions. If you have any questions that come up in mind, uh, please submit them now. I see a couple coming through. I'd love to get a couple more as I'm finishing up my lecture. Um, just hit that Q&A button on the bottom bar. Uh, you can submit a question and it will come to me and I'll be able to answer it as they come up. So uh, any of you that have any questions about what I'm talking about or further questions about the issue more broadly, uh, please feel free to, to just pop that in there. But one of the questions I, I imagine is on many of your minds is that, you know, what's happening actually physically and medically and epidemiologically with the coronavirus and the homeless population? Um, there was really massive speculation early on in the crisis during the time when uh, national um, policymakers would um, uh, were saying that there could be up to 2 million deaths in the United States when all of the models were just hitting that red line. They were just throttling at the most extreme measures. Uh, the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, he predicted in public um, that up to 66,000 homeless California residents could be infected with the coronavirus. This was a really apocalyptic scenario. But the, the actual truth of the matter was, um, was actually very slow to materialize. And I think it surprised a lot of experts, uh, health experts. It certainly surprised me. Um, what you've seen is that there's really no social distancing on the streets. There's no mask policies. I was on the streets in uh, in, in Washington state uh, this week. Um, I've talked to people on the streets in San Francisco and LA to get their take. 
And they basically said that there's really no mask adoption, there's no social distancing, um, there's large crowds of people, they're uh, you know, sharing food, sharing needles, sharing uh, you know, bodily fluids, sharing kind of um, within the sneeze zone, uh, you could say. And in shelters, which is another potential vector for transmission, um, they tried to maintain some social distancing, but at the end of the day, these are open air shelters with medically vulnerable people in close quarters and many times uh, that already struggle with sanitation issues. Um, and then if you look at a place like Skid Row in Los Angeles that I've covered extensively, um, they already have um, tremendous problems with the transmission of disease, um, including typhus, including um, medieval diseases, hepatitis A, um, that this was really predicted at a certain time uh, last month as going to be explosive but it never really materialized in a quick way. Um, I talked with the leader of one of the largest homeless shelters in Los Angeles, and, and he informed me that um, up until about a week ago, they only had a handful of cases. Um, in San Francisco, it was the same story. About two or three weeks ago, there was only a handful of cases. And really only in the last week or two have we seen outbreaks in emergency shelters and outbreaks on the streets. And um, there's really no good explanation for why this is the case. I suspect it could be a delay in testing, but it, it, it could be something else. We're not quite sure. Um, but what we do know is that within the homeless shelters, just like within the prison system, federal prisons where they've done studies, there's an extremely high rate of asymptomatic cases. So what that means is uh, they've tested people in shelters, they've tested people in prisons, and it's starting to become widespread over the last few weeks, um, but many, if not the vast majority of these cases are asymptomatic. People are not presenting coughs or fevers uh, and certainly not presenting the kind of grave illnesses uh, that we feared. So um, I don't know, there's, a, there's a, a kind of anecdotal and small scale studies that are coming in from all over the world. Uh, a number of studies have suggested that cigarette smoking actually prevents, uh, actually in, in somewhat reduces the chance of getting the coronavirus or getting serious symptoms. Uh, again, cigarette smoking you'd think is actually, typically would be a, uh, a danger to your health. But in this case, for some reason, the rates among cigarette smokers are less. Um, the, the, the asymptomatic rates in the homeless and jail populations seems to be higher than the general population from the data that we have available now. Again, no, kind of definitive explanation to why. But the good news is that these shelters have not really become mass casualty and mass fatality zones. And even the outdoor encampments uh, have not become the kind of very explosive vectors of transmission that the public health experts were predicting just a number of weeks ago. So uh, I think that that's really an open question right now. I don't pretend to know the answer. I don't think anyone knows the answer, but I think that will be an open question. And the second question that I think uh, we all really need to be following is, uh, is, is what is going to happen to these cities when they emerge from the coronavirus crisis? And this is really the pessimistic point that I'll be making, and, uh, and un unfortunately the pessimistic point. Um, what we've seen, although I think policymakers in places like San Francisco are starting to finally break out of this mass denial about, um, about, uh, about addiction and mental illness and permissive policies. Unfortunately, in their rhetoric, they're starting to understand, hey, this is actually a, 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 a problem that we don't know how to deal with, we really need to take hold of, we need to design policies to address them so we don't make the problem worse. Unfortunately, the policies that they've actually adopted in the past month have been um, potentially catastrophic and actually going in the opposite direction. And you've seen this in Seattle, San Francisco, and Los Angeles uh, alike, and Vancouver, British Columbia, to our north. What you've seen them do is what I call a policy of uh, decarceration uh, and decriminalization. So San Francisco has reduced their, their city and county jail population, um, of which 40% of all inmates are homeless, by more than 50%. Um, and they've released thousands of prisoners in Washington state, thousands of prisoners and, and jail inmates in California. Um, and in San Francisco, it's almost 50% of their entire jail population uh, 
they've, they've just released onto the streets. Uh, as I've demonstrated, including many violent offenders uh, and including uh, many homeless who have literally nowhere else to go. So you're seeing the public policy response from prosecutors and, and law enforcement, uh, the kind of political decisions. Um, you're seeing them really just release uh, people onto the streets, which I think is going to create um, a downstream problem with, uh, with crime, with uh, kind of disturbances in neighborhood, uh, in neighborhoods. And the second policy is a policy of decriminalization. And, and, and this is really what's new and what I think is potential for being disastrous in the coming years. Um, San Francisco, believe it or not, actually reduced the number of illegal tent encampments over the last four years by about 50%. Um, they were doing aggressive cleanups, aggressive outreach, um, and although they didn't reduce the number of uh, overall number of homeless, they were actually able to kind of clean up the streets over time. It was a, a huge effort um, and, and, and went through a lot of political blowback. And they've essentially abandoned that plan completely. And they've not only decriminalized drug use and, uh, and open camping, but they've really decriminalized um, tent encampments all over the city. My sources in San Francisco say that it's never been worse, um, you know, that alleyways all over the city, streets all over the city, parks all over the city have been flooded with tents. Um, the policymakers, um, the, the political leaders and the nonprofit leaders in San Francisco have adopted what uh, a newspaper columnist is calling a tents for all policies. So they're handing out hundreds and at this point thousands of tents and telling people to essentially camp wherever you want, um, stay inside your tents um, and we'll be providing services, but essentially there are no more rules. And then the third part of the policy, uh, decarceration, decriminalization, and depolicing. And what that means is that police departments in really every jurisdiction on the major West Coast cities have been instructed to pull back, to limit public contact, to limit enforcement to only the most serious crimes. And what I'm hearing both statistically and both uh, narratively through my on the ground reporting is that you're seeing a huge spike in burglaries and other property crimes in downtown in the downtown cores of our major cities and the the the, the problem that I see happening is even as the lockdowns are lifted even as the coronavirus um, uh, over the as the summer comes and the 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 lockdown policies have 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 made their way um, you're going to see a new status quo. And right now it's a low tide situation where uh, your general traffic in downtown areas has, has disappeared. But very soon you're going to see an increase in kind of the general population trafficking, tr kind of moving through the urban centers of West Coast cities. But the status quo is going to be changed dramatically. You're now going to have more tents than ever, more open air drug markets than ever and, and, and a, a, a new population of people that are operating um, in this new legal environment. And I think it's gonna be very difficult given the, um, really the cowardice of predominantly progressive political leaders in these places, they're not gonna wanna be perceived as criminalizing homelessness or jailing people or enforcing the law or supporting aggressive law enforcement. They're gonna wake up in about a month to a dramatically new street scene that is um, worse than it's ever been, uh, certainly worse than it's been in the last 10 years. And any gains that they've made will have been lost. And in fact, it's gonna be much more difficult. And I think it's going to, going to really um, become a, a paradox and, and, and really a, um, a, a, a huge tension in the progressive mind. Um, what you're gonna see is that Progressive leaders like London Bream have admitted that finally that addiction, mental illness, and, and permissive policies have created the concentrated uh, unsheltered homelessness in their cities. But politically, they're not going to be able to adopt any policies that address them. So you're seeing, uh, you know, in, in metaphorically almost a, 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 a kind of split personality uh, public policy where people are finally realizing the true causes of what's happening, but they're, they're, they're kind of uh, political, from a position of policymaking and political power, they're unable to actually address them and solve some of those problems. So it's, um, it's going to be, um, I'm afraid, worse than ever.
but I think that we cannot maintain those fictions and hopefully what we'll see is the rise of a countervailing political power in American cities that can actually um, contest those, those dominant narratives that have really crumbled uh, amidst the coronavirus pandemic. And I, I, I think it's gotta come from big businesses and small businesses, it's gotta come from neighbors, it's gotta come from uh, conservatives, but more importantly in these cities, moderate uh, Democrats and liberals, um, they're going to have to at some point abandon the kind of wholly ideological commitments of the progressive wing and realize that when there are needles and tents and, and, uh, and, and, and the insane that have really taken over entire neighborhoods and their cities, they're going to have to address that. And I think that's the open political question. So I've yacked for about 30 minutes. I'm going to take some questions. We see some great ones coming in. Um, um, you know, Brian, Brian asks, why do I encounter more homeless screaming and yelling in Seattle and Portland than I do anywhere else? Even other countries, are the drugs different? Um, yes and no. I think uh, to a certain extent, the access to drugs in the United States, especially the West Coast, is, uh, is actually quite incredible. Uh, I talked with the, um, with the U.S. attorney and then the uh, head of the DEA for the Northwest region for the federal government, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and he told me that about 80% of the hard drugs, which are uh, methamphetamines, heroin, and fentanyl, they're coming from Mexico, from the cartels, and they have a direct pipeline on I-5 that goes from, you know, kind of San Diego uh, all the way up to Seattle. This is a major drug corridor. About 80% of the drugs, the hardcore drugs, come from Mexico. Um, so there's very um, kind of, you know, containers full of hardcore narcotics at, at very low prices right now. And then the remaining 20% actually gets shipped in the mail from China, uh, the main, remaining percentage of fentanyl, for example. Um, and again, it's shipping into San Francisco, it's shipping into the sorting center in Seattle. We don't have a very good system for sorting the mail, identifying the fentanyl. It's very small uh, in, in physical size. So you have a different technology of addiction, is what I like to, to call it, where you have, um, in, in many cases, um, what you see on the streets is actually not someone who was maybe born uh, mentally ill. Uh, perhaps they had a genetic predisposition, but you get what psychiatrists call, for example, meth-induced psychosis. That if you, if you smoke and inject enough methamphetamines, it can actually induce schizophrenia. It can actually mimic the symptoms of schizophrenia. And it's diagnosed by psychiatrists as uh, essentially drug-induced mental illness, drug-induced psychosis. So, um, I saw that, I mean, on the streets very plainly. Um, people that are, uh, because the caseworkers know their background, they're both mentally ill and drug addicted or drug addicted and um, uh, which has induced uh, kind of mental illness or symptoms of mental illness. Um, but the thing about Seattle and Portland is that they, they really accept the worst part of street, they, they embrace the worst aspects of street homelessness. Someone told me a, a actually a recovered um, uh, methamphetamine uh, addict um, who actually lost both of his arms. Uh, he was uh, on a drug bender, fell asleep on a train track, um, had both of his arms uh, uh, run over by the train and lost both of his arms but survived. Uh, Ten years later now he's cleaned up his life and uh, I sat down with him in Olympia, Washington this week and uh, I said, hey, what's, you know, what's the deal? Why, you know, you're from uh, you know, Springfield, Missouri, why did you come to Olympia? And, and he told me, this is a, a, a direct quotation, uh, he said, Olympia is a paradise of homeless. Um, it's like Walt Disney. And then he said something that I thought was very telling. He said, you don't have to be ashamed to be homeless here. And I think that kind of cultural attitude is pervasive uh, throughout these West Coast cities. And and frankly, you see it in the data. You see at least half of the people in Seattle and Portland, I, I actually think it's much more than that, are coming from somewhere else because uh, it's tolerated and it's embraced to, uh, to, to live that lifestyle. You know you're not gonna get in trouble for shooting up on the streets. You know that there's a active culture that, um, that you can feel a part of there. And political leaders have created that environment. And I'll, I'll, I'll just illustrate this, I think, um, kind of prove this, if you will, with one uh, quick thought exercise. So if Seattle, Washington has a huge uh, population of unsheltered homelessness, 
But just across the bridge, the neighboring city of Bellevue, Washington doesn't. And the difference is public policies. Um, whereas Seattle encourages and I think enables some of these problems um, associated with street homelessness, Bellevue enforces them and they balance compassion with responsibility and accountability. And as a consequence, even though they're neighboring cities, even though they're both urban environments, even though they're both in the same regional economy, even though they're both kind of equal as far as um, uh, uh, you know, the regional effects, um, you see very different outcomes. And I think almost exclusively attributed to public policy. We're gonna look through. Um, Kathy asks, does providing shelter during coronavirus really help when they're allowed to come and go as they please? Um, this is a, a really essential question. I think that you've, you've really hit the nail on the head. The, the question right now, and I think this is a question that transcends homelessness, but really, uh, really goes to the heart of, of homelessness, mental illness, addiction, um, and, and, um, and frankly, really ruined lives that you see on the streets. Um, we've moved away from any kind of compulsion. Um, so, for example, you saw in China, in Wuhan, uh, when they had the coronavirus, they were um, taking, they were uh, soldering people inside their apartments that were infected. I mean, literally, um, you know, kind of putting iron bars and soldering people inside. Um, and, and I think that that is uh, inhumane, it's cruel, um, it's authoritarian. And I think that in, in the United States, we rightly uh, are concerned about our constitutional freedoms and we would uh, really revolt if anything like that happened. But on the other side of it, I think that what we've done is we've gone too far in the, uh, in the direction of maximum individual liberties. And we've, and we've essentially, through court rulings and policy decisions, um, we've essentially said you have the individual right to be homeless, to be insane, uh, to hurt yourself, to cause chaos in the streets. Um, that's your individual freedom. But what you see in reality is that the folks who are screaming in the streets, who are obviously uh, you know, hurting to the core, who are really, you can watch their lives just shatter in front of you. Uh, you know, one gentleman was in a wheelchair that I met this week, for example. His feet were rotting. Um, he has sores over his body. He was, uh, he would, was be huffing paint in front of police officers um, and was uh, also suffering from a severe mental illness. Um, that's not freedom. That's not uh, a constitutional right to, uh, to, to live that way, to damage the community. And I think what we need is now a new social compact where we say we outline not only people's rights, but also people's responsibilities. And I think that that's gonna come with a certain amount of compulsion. And to Kathy's point, I think that if you just allow people uh, unlimited rights to, uh, to harm themselves and others with no corresponding responsibilities, that's gonna be a disaster. I'm gonna look through some other. Um... Uh, another person asks, how do we counter the prevailing, prevailing narrative? Como TV in Seattle has done a good job, but there are others who share your view. Um, this is the really remarkable question and the, the, the question is really, um, you know, how do you, how do you combat what has essentially become the, uh, the dogma of the political class and also the activist class and then much of the media and academia in our cities? And, uh, and on one hand, uh, you know, our, our point of view is politically vastly outnumbered. These are, again, the most progressive cities in the country, all of the institutions academia, philanthropy, media, government, activism, um, are all oriented towards believing the kind of myth uh, and, and, and kind of, uh, uh, kind of ide ideological commitments, the ideological dogma behind this. And, and, and it's very hard to break through. So that's the, the negative part. The positive part is that if you look at the public polling data in San Francisco and LA and in Seattle, the public, actually a huge majority of the public, doesn't believe this narrative. Um, you know, you look at the polling from USC Schwarzenegger Center, um, uh, you look at the polling from the uh, Elway poll here in Washington State, uh, you, you look at uh, polling in, in, in Oregon, uh, 
Um, the public by large majority, 70% plus, they understand that homelessness is caused by addiction and mental illness. And by large majorities, 55% uh, or in some cases up to 60 and 70%, the public believes that they have to, that policymakers have to maintain order in the streets. They have to enforce the laws against public camping. They have to provide opportunities for shelter and treatment, but they can't simply keep going with these permissive policies. So what do you get when you put those two things together? You have a political class that is really enforcing a minority opinion. Um, and you have a, a, the public by, I, I think about 60 to 70% actually really support everything that I've just uh, outlined in the past uh, 43 yeah. minutes. The problem is that that public attitude has never been translated into political organization and political power. So um, there's no way to translate this kind of dormant public sentiment into a media narrative, into a, uh, a political organization, into elected office, into positions of authority, and, and into uh, essentially an, a real institutional opposition. And um, I, I, I've tried to, um, uh, to, to point this out and to advocate for this. And, and, but, but frankly, it's going to take a reckoning on the left. It's going to take moderates of, on both sides, left and right, to come together and actually organize. But the paradox, the, the, what's stopping that from happening is that most kind of that 70% majority of people are not politically engaged. And there's nowhere to, to put their sentiment or put their vote. Um, and unfortunately, you're just seeing, like in Seattle, um, the city council elections last year elected the same people and actually elected worse people than they had before, despite this huge public sentiment uh, against the status quo and all of the polling data. And I think what that shows is that the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and other organizations were unable to muster uh, the political power to, to balance out the kind of activist uh, class. And what you're seeing as a result, I've, I've gotten a, a dozen emails this week about Ballard, the neighborhood in Seattle that used to be my old neighborhood. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the, the Ballard Commons Park has essentially been overrun by dozens of tents, hundreds of people um, creating chaos, committing crimes, uh, 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 you know, discarding needles, um, making, uh, you know, life really unlivable for the citizens there who are irate. But unfortunately, they elected people who are okay with that. And you've seen no, uh, no movement to actually tackle these problems. Let's look. Um, oh, wow. Tons of questions. This is great. Let's find a really good one. Um, so this is a great question. Um, so Jody's asking, stigmatizing homelessness and drug addiction is blamed for further marginalizing and exacerbating the problem, yet this intuitive response forms the basis for demanding change. Um, are we to allow society at large uh, to be prohibited from speaking out for fear of being uh, called you know, a stigmatizer uh, or uncaring? Is this new political correctness pushing against civil reality? Um, that is, an, um, uh, I think, really sums up an important question. So thanks for that, Jody. You know, I, I've studied um, the question of stigma for a, a while now because I think it's, it's really important. And what you've seen is a movement to destigmatize almost any kind of behavior. So um, it's been really central to political thought since the 1960s. Uh, you had the famous sociologist Irving Goffman who studied stigma. You had the kind of radical philosopher Michel Foucault in France who's been very influential among kind of progressives um, uh, and, and, and radical uh, left in the United States. And, and they really embarked on a campaign to destroy any idea of stigma. They thought that stigma was the source of the problem. And you see that, um, you know, I saw a, a tweet, for example, something trivial, someone who's running for, uh, I think, a supervisor or a state legislature in San Francisco. And she said that uh, stigma causes homelessness. And and the problem will be solved if we stopped stigma. Uh, this gets it exactly backwards. I think if you look at shame cultures around the world, certainly there's a problem with stigma when it's extreme, when you stigmatize uh, you know, the, maybe something that doesn't deserve to be stigmatized, when stigma is, is enforced uh, brutally or, or in an authoritarian way or in a repressive way culturally. So I think that there's 
certainly, I mean, these sociologists and philosophers raise legitimate problems with how stigma has played a role throughout society. But what we've done is we've swung the pendulum in the other direction, that we've actually um, stopped stigmatizing some of the most problematic aspects of street uh, homelessness. We've actually lionized them and we've elevated them to a kind of untouchable uh, lifestyle and, and, and really idealize them. And I think that this is uh, exactly the wrong way to go. And I think what we've forgotten is that stigma uh, actually plays a, an important social role in preventing social problems, in containing, uh, uh, you know, uh, in containing uh, social pathologies that could undermine the wider society. And we've really forgotten those lessons. And we've thought that through a kind of utopian political promises and, and through advances in medical technology and social science, we've thought that we could essentially transcend uh, the role of human uh, stigma and, and the role of shame, frankly. Uh, frankly. But um, what we found is that we're not there yet and that we, we don't have a, a kind of perfectible people or a perfectible society. And I think that's a big part of the issue. Um, what's your take on the impact of virus associated blows to government budgets at all levels to, and to the ability to maintain current policy on homelessness? It's a question from Randall. Um, this is an interesting question. So um, I, I think what you're seeing is that state and local budgets are likely to take a big hit, um, but um, we're not really sure how that's shaking out. But what I can tell you at the, at the federal level, and I've been uh, writing a paper on this with the Heritage Foundation in Washington, DC, is at the federal level, homelessness funding has actually um, increased dramatically since coronavirus. As part of the CARES Act, um, the relief fund uh, over the past month or six weeks, um, there's been $9 billion in additional spending um, on, on top of about $2.8 billion a year. Um, so in, in the short term, homelessness spending at HUD at the federal level has actually tripled in the past two months. And I'm working with policymakers and administrators and, um, and, uh, and some people on Secretary Ben Carson's team to figure out, to try to help figure out, to do some policy analysis, figure out where that money might best be spent. So it isn't frankly squandered like most of the homelessness money has been spent. But I, I think you also have to recognize that um, in San Francisco, spending on homelessness is already more than a billion dollars a year. In Seattle, it's already more than a billion dollars a year. In Los Angeles, um, uh, if you tally all the spending, it's already more than a billion dollars a year, uh, just at that local and county level. So we're already spending a huge sum of money. And I, I think that the conclusion that I've drawn is that if you throw money at a broken system that incentivizes all the wrong things, um, actually at a certain point, the money makes things worse. So I hope that as um, governments sort through priorities, maybe they can have a reality check and, and understand that with limited resources, what's the best way to tackle this problem? We have time for a couple more questions. Again, thank you so much for um, uh, for, uh, for 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 participating. Um, I'm looking for some other questions here. Feel free to submit some more. We have a couple of good ones. Um, uh, so, how does Discovery plan to help us mobilize to address the problems on the horizon regarding permissive policies? That's from Tamra. Uh, thanks, Tamara. So what we're doing is uh, we've launched an initiative called fixhomelessness.org. So that's just fixhomelessness.org. There's a website that's been set up. Um, and what we're trying to do is to provide policymaker, policymakers at the local, state, and federal level with the uh, research that we've been doing, with specific action plans that we've done. You know, we, we even commissioned a legal guide from one of the uh, city, uh, one of the attorneys on the Supreme Court case, Martin versus Boise, that determines how cities can handle homelessness. Uh, we actually commissioned him to write a paper for us to advise cities on how to enforce the law and remain in legal compliance with the uh, Supreme Court rulings. Um, so we've created really a body of research and, and specific action plans for cities uh, and state and federal governments. So if you go to fixhomelessness.org, you can enter your email address. You can get all of these resources for free. It's really a, a kind of a condensation of two years of study, two years of hard work, two years of research, two years of advocacy. And, and our role at the Center on Wealth and Poverty is really to uh, 
get all of our research, all of the best information, all of the best knowledge and insights into the hands of local community leaders, into the hands of uh, faith-based organizations, into the hands of uh, community activists, into the hands of police officers, firefighters, city council members, state legislators, uh, and, and even, uh, you know, we did a trip to the White House to share some of our research uh, with policymakers at the highest levels of the federal government. So all of that's available for free. And our mission is to really be the kind of intellectual ammunition for a movement to reform. And um, tactically, I think what we've decided is that uh, we're really working with where we can be most effective. And uh, frankly, uh, there's not going to be any huge changes in Seattle or San Francisco or LA inside the city. But what we can do is we can operate with an outside in strategy. So we're helping smaller cities, suburban areas, other counties in, in Washington state, for example, design policies that are different in substance than those in Seattle. And if we can demonstrate uh, an effective outcomes in smaller cities and counties, we can then put political pressure on those big cities where people can say, wait a minute, if Pierce County, if Snohomish County, if uh, you know, uh, you know, Island County, even rural counties, Spokane County, if they've been able to adopt different policies and have better results, um, you know, why can't we do the same here? So again, that's, that's fixhomelessness.org. Uh, sign up today, it's free. You get all the best uh, research, you can share it with anyone you might be connected to. Uh, share it with your city council member. Uh, share it with your um, you know, local community groups. Share it with, uh, with anyone you want. It's, uh, it's free to use. It's just a resource. So I'll take uh, one more question and then we'll, we'll break. Wow, this hour blew by. It blew by for me. I hope it blew by for you. Um, David has a great question. Besides San Francisco mayor who's seeming to get it, do you see any national politicians who have been consistently focused on this issue? Um, this is a really great question and something that I've been exploring really, uh, you know, uh, only in depth in the last few months. My research has been mostly focused on local and state uh, policies, uh, but I've been fortunate enough to work with some of the best national figures um, on, um, on policy. And there's a really, uh, I, as we're finding, a really small number of people that are focused on homelessness at the federal level. Um, and all of the homelessness funding, not all, but the vast majority is, is administered through HUD, through Housing and Urban Development. And um, unfortunately, HUD has adopted all of the wrong policies over the past 15 years. Uh, and I'm working with a coalition of leaders to, to actually reform HUD from the inside out and to get some major regulatory uh, reform, a major funding reform. Um, but what we found is that um, there's really a paradoxical, uh, not paradoxical, there's really a, a kind of uh, a, a problematic ar arrangement of power at the federal level where um, the people who are most concerned about homelessness in Congress, for example, are the people who are in the most progressive districts where homelessness is the biggest problem and where they receive the most funding from HUD about homelessness. So you have really a cycle of perverse incentives that uh, Congress members are really incentivized to keep the money coming from HUD um, in the places where the policies have been the worst and where homelessness keeps getting worse and worse and worse and delivers, frankly, the worst outcomes. Um, so we're trying to disrupt that cycle. And unfortunately, the, the problem is that policymakers in, in smaller communities um, that might be more amenable philosophically really haven't been engaged with homelessness because they represent districts where um, it's not really a huge problem like it is in the major urban environments of our coastal cities. So uh, we're trying to work tactically with, um, with policymakers and legislators that, that, that are, are with it on this issue. There are some, there are some key legislators, um, there are some key swing state legislators that have an enormous amount of power. So I, I'm optimistic, I think in the next year, uh, we're gonna see some movement at the federal level for some reform. Uh, and, and it really is just um, whether this coalition that's formed, this kind of national reform coalition on homelessness can muster up the political will and, and, and to outmaneuver, uh, you know, what as kind of in jest has been called the swamp, but is actually truly a real thing, um, you know, as we're finding out and as, as people who have been in this fight for much longer than I have, uh, have really explained to me. So, um, you know, I, I think people get it. I think it's become part of the national conversation. It's really been a source of national shame for uh, big city blue, uh, blue mayors 
Um, so I, I, I'm cautiously optimistic we'll see uh, movement at the federal level. Um, I'm more optimistic that we're going to see significant movement in smaller and medium-sized cities and non-urban counties. I think those are going to see some tremendous changes in the next few years. Uh, and I'm pessimistic about the near future for those big cities. So um, that's it. I'll give you everyone two minutes back. You can, uh, you can kind of digest all this information. Um, but I, I really appreciate everyone uh, participating. It's been a great time to talk. I hope all of you are safe. I hope all of you are healthy um, and grateful for your time. I know you've probably been doing a lot of Zoom uh, interviews and conference calls, uh, but it's great to have you. And I, I'd say if you could do one thing, it's sign up at fixhomelessness.org and uh, download those resources and send a link to the website uh, to everyone you know who might be interested, but most importantly to the policymakers and the decision makers in your city, uh, in your county, in your state, uh, because uh, really we need to all engage on this and get the information, the research and the recommendations into the hands of the right people. Uh, thank you so much. I'm gonna end that here. Really appreciate your time and uh, God bless.